lectures, we're going to look at two types of long spans, uh, form active and vector active. And we've looked at both of these types of structures before. Uh, very, very early on, when we were looking at simple structures, we looked at form active structures like arches uh, and, uh, and cables because we could assume that they were all in one uh, state of stress or another, compression or tension. Uh, vector active, remember, are trusses. So we've already done some calculations with them. What we'll look at this week are vector active structures that are two-way instead of one-way, what we call space frames. So these are two different types, uh, but because we've looked at both of them before, um, we're going to combine them when we look at long spans and look at basically the qualitative aspects of them. In other words, what we're looking for when we design them, the basic sort of mechanics, what happens when we blow them up uh, to slightly larger scales than we've looked at uh, previously. So we'll look at two types of form active structures, short vaults. Remember last week we looked at section active long vaults, and we'll talk again about what the difference between the two is. We'll look at tension structures, uh, cable structures used architecturally instead of just in bridges. And then we'll switch, and in the third part we'll look at vector active long spans, so uh, trusses set at angles to one another uh, that make uh, space frames. In this particular lecture, we'll look at uh, short vaults. Uh, what happens when we take the arch or cable principles that we looked at in 346 uh, and apply them either uh, in an extruded form or at spans that are maybe greater than we were looking at uh, in earlier classes. So if you remember last week when we talked about long vaults, we said basically uh, those were shapes that were trying to be beams, that were spanning in the long direction. And what we're looking for when we design long vaults is basically any amount of depth and therefore any amount of section modulus resisting to resistance to bending that we can get. When we talk about short vaults, we're talking about vaults whose structural mechanism is actually in the direction of the curve. So these are traditional arches, but as we'll see when we extrude them, we're looking for some very specific behaviors that, that, that we want to be able to rely on. If you think about it, a short vault, <clears throat> it's not necessarily a dimensional thing. There's no sort of uh, uh, distance where suddenly we go from short to long vault. It's really thinking about the behavior. And in a short vault, remember that we're looking at forces that flow uh, along the section, along the curvature of the arch. And we will always have uh, uh, issues with both the gravity loads, we have to hold the arch up, and thrusts, we have to hold the arches in, we have to keep them from flattening out. This is one way we can tell, if we're looking at an engineered structure, whether we're looking at a short vault or a long vault, is what the, what the buttressing is like uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the edges. So short vaults, uh, we have to basically resist thrusts. What we're talking about essentially are very, very deep arches, uh, and they will tend to push out their uh, foundations or tend to push out their walls if we put them up uh, on top of something. We talked when we talked about arches about things like tension rods that take the thrust on one side of the arch and resist it with the thrust on the other. We also talked about big walls, uh, like in Roman construction, where they resisted the thrust of the arch basically by uh, overturning resistance, right? So the arch is trying to thrust out, the walls are very heavy, it takes an awful lot to pry them up out of the ground uh, and tip them over. As we'll see though, there are other ways to do this. We can use uh, stiffening ribs, uh, we can use doubly curved surfaces, we'll look at this more when we look at surface structures, and of course we can use uh, ties with cables, things like that. These often will get in the way of what we want to do functionally. Uh, a lot of times we're relying on the curvature of the arch to get extra height uh, in a program like say an aircraft hangar. So for those we may have to look at something other than uh, a tie rod, but this is a perfectly legitimate way uh, to resist the thrusts of a, of a short vault. One of the most famous ones of these, and one that shows up all the time in architectural history classes, is Robert Maillard's Concrete Pavilion, uh, the Swiss Exposition in 1939. This is the image that you sort of typically see of it, and it was this uh, pavilion, and particularly this photograph of it, that made it seem like concrete could do anything, uh, and that this new discipline of shell structures uh, could create these kind of impossibly thin, super big span uh, structures. 
But there are a couple of tricks that may are used for this structure that are really instructive when we think about uh, making, making these short vaults, especially out of concrete. When you look at the photo, you're looking at the sort of thin edge uh, of, the, of the vault uh, or the, of the shell. Um, and you're also looking at it from a very funny perspective. If you look closely, you can see there's a staircase here, there's a bridge here. It's actually a fairly small structure, uh, only about 25 or 30 feet tall. In the picture, it looks like it could be a couple hundred, right? But Mayart also worked in a number of tricks or a number of hacks to make the shell seem thinner uh, than it was, to make it seem like it was spanning in a slightly more incredible way than it actually was. Um, first of all, there is a bridge that goes across the shell. You can see it right here. There's the door where you come in, you walk across it, there's a door on the other side. That bridge, as you uh, may have guessed, is actually a tension rod that holds the bottom of the arch together, that resists the thrust in the middle of the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the vault's depth. So there, right there, we have a very traditional way uh, of making the, the long arch work, or the short vault work, right? Resisting the, the thrust of the arch with a tension rod in the middle. There's steel in that bridge, the surface is concrete, but there's steel that's basically holding the sides together. And you can see too in this construction photo that there are these two wings, right? These two kind of ears that are at the edges of the vault. And those are actually beams. These are similar to the stiffening beams that we saw when we looked at long vaults. What they're doing is they're basically taking the tension, the tensile resistance of the bridge, and they're using uh, that as an anchor, and then they're cantilevering on either side, right? But in the horizontal direction, not the vertical direction. And those are basically holding the corners of that vault in, right? They're resisting the, the tendency of the uh, arch to flatten out at the extreme edges, and then they're anchored to one another by that bridge in the middle. Here in this drawing, you can maybe see it a little bit easier. These are the kind of uh, ears that are, you can imagine them holding the, uh, the, 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 the bottoms of that shell, the corners of that shell in place, resisting the thrust out at the edges. And then here is that big tie rod that goes across the middle. You can see too that Maillard has designed these two stiffening arches that give it uh, some additional rigidity. This is a very, very clever structure because when you're standing at that one place, the shell looks like it disappears. You're just seeing the sort of two or three inch thickness of uh, the shell at the edges, and all of this kind of secondary structure is basically hidden, or at least kind of suppressed. Looking at construction photos, you can see a little more clearly, there's the bridge that ties the two pieces together. Here are the horizontal beams at the end. And so the, the ground plane, it's basically a, a giant H shape or I shape. These ears are cantilevered out horizontally again, uh, from the anchor points where that tie rod goes across, and they're making the shell kind of work as an arch, right? They're resisting the, the thrust uh, of that arch. Now, Mayar can get away with this because it's a fairly thin shell. There's a lot of reinforcing steel in it, but there's not a, a lot of weight compared with, say, the weight of a Roman arch, right? Which would be a very, very heavy stone arch. All of the weight of that stone gets translated into thrust at the base. Here there's a lot less weight pushing down, and therefore there's a lot less thrust pushing out. You can see too that Maillard is clever enough to use a funicular shape, right? This is a, a, a parabola very close to a catenary shape, uh, and that means that the, the, the forces in the shell are tending to flow down that shape in pure compression. So he's lessening the amount of thrust uh, in the arch, although there's always still going to be some. Uh, and he's taking that, uh, that sort of lingering thrust up with these horizontal cantilever beams uh, and the tie rod going, going across it. Like many other long span structures we'll see, um, we've got the big overall shape, the, the, the catenary shape, uh, short vault, and then we have this secondary structure, these collar beams, the collar arches over the top, the tie rod across the center, these secondary structures that make that primary structure hold on to its shape, that prevent it from losing uh, its good uh, catenary or, or parabolic uh, arch shape. 
We see short arches working in a number of different ways. So here's a pavilion uh, also from the 30s, thin shell, very, very shallow arch now. So not a great structural shape, uh, remember, right? So there's gonna be an awful lot of thrust here. Um, and you can see that that thrust is resisted basically by tie rods that now go across the top. If you think about what this arch is doing, it's trying to push those columns out and over. And those columns are tied together by a tension rod across the top. And you can see that they're even balanced by these little uh, gull wings that come off of the edges. So there's some weight on the outside that's actually pulling back, right? Trying to pull the, the columns outward while the arch thrust or the, while the, the cable is trying to pull them inward. So a fairly complex structure here, but again, the tie rod now very cleverly being hidden up above the shell surface. So when we're standing underneath it, those are less visible. And again, we see this kind of magically thin uh, edge of the, of the concrete shell uh, in, its, in its place. Here, uh, Eugene Fréginet, a famous uh, French engineer designing airship hangars at Orly, the airport in Paris. And you can see that Fréginet is going to hack this structure in a number of different ways. This arch comes all the way to the ground, so Fréginet can take advantage of very, very deep, very, very robust foundations using the weight of the earth, basically, to resist the kind of outward thrust of the, of the, of the short vault. You can see very clearly that Fréginet is using a, a parabolic or a catenary geometry. This is the, the traveling scaffold that was used to build each one of these arches uh, in sequence. And the, the catenary shape, of course, limits the amount of thrust at the bottom. And then you can see, too, that he's using basically a folded plate, right? This is a section of the arch, and you can see that it has some depth to it. It's hollow on the inside. It has an exterior skin here, interior skin here. And that depth is going to mean that the, the arch can take local bending. So when the wind blows unequally, right, pushing on one side, uh, the hanger. Uh, this is going to act a little bit like a beam spanning from the foundation to the top, and that depth is going to allow it to take uh, some of that uh, some of that bending uh, stress that it gets from the wind. But also, that depth makes the arch feel like it's a very very thick column, but without all of the uh, weight in in the middle, right? Without all of the dead weight in the center. Remember the best shape for a column or a compression structure that, that's trying to resist buckling is a hollow tube. And Fréginet has built these parabolic arches uh, knowing full well that they're going to be in compression, knowing that they're going to be subject to buckling. He's designed them basically as hollow tubes where the structural material is all concentrated uh, on the outside, right? the, the perimeter uh, of, the, of the column. A really, really clever structure. And he, of course, is also thinking about how you build it. So here is a section through the scaffolding. You can see a couple traveling cranes on top. This uh, vector active structure, right? A, a, a parabolic truss that forms the basis of the scaffold. And that will sort of walk along the job site uh, as they pour concrete into the, the formwork that it leaves. They can then disarm the formwork, drop it down, uh, move it over to the, to the next arch all kinds of ideas working together. And we see this again and again in long span structures that engineers, designers are kind of hacking together multiple ways of spanning uh, distances, multiple ways of building things, trying to integrate the final shape so that it is something that is structurally efficient, but also capable of being built in a, in a repetitive or sometimes algorithmic uh, way. And then our kind of favorite short vault. This is uh, Pierluigi Nervi's uh, Salone B at the Turin Exposition Hall. We've talked about this one before, built in a matter of uh, a, a few months uh, at the end of World War II for this big uh, auto show that the city of Turin wanted to have. Beautiful structure built in little tiny pieces, each one of these little uh, ferro cement uh, like little canoes being sort of glued together to form uh, the roof. But if you look carefully, you can see that this is in fact a, a short vault. It's a very, very shallow arch, so not a particularly efficient form structurally. But you can see that Nervi has designed giant concrete buttresses uh, on the sides, and these fans collect the load from each one of these uh, ribs. 
into one of these uh, slanted buttresses at, at the sides that then uh, takes the thrust that you get with a very, very shallow short span vault uh, and, and conducts it down into the ground, into the foundations, again, using the earth uh, to take up the, the thrust of the, of the arch. You can see too, if you look closely, that it's a, it hacks together a bunch of ideas. It's a folded plate. Um, this is a corrugated roof surface that makes the roof think that it's a few feet deep when in fact the ferrocement is only about three inches thick. And what this does is it means that the roof can function not just as a shallow arch, but really as a beam arch, right? It has that depth that gives it a little bit of section modulus, a little bit of capacity for bending. So this is really a, a kind of hybrid structure. It's working mostly like a shallow arch, but it's capable of taking bending. And if you look closely, you can see that those arches taper as they come down to the, to the buttresses. Uh, that's a sign that, that Nervi knows that it's going to be in bending, right? The taper is uh, a very, very good form, remember, for a simple beam, right? Thin at the edges, thick in the middle where the maximum bending moment happens. So this is basically what we call a beam arch, but it's also a folded plate and it's also a, a, a short vault. And here, a better look at the, the buttresses, which are over here, the fans that collect the loads from each one of those ribs and take them down uh, in, into the ground. And if we look at the, um, the beam arch a little more closely, you can see here is the, the shape of the roof. It's nowhere near a parabola, uh, nowhere near a catenary shape. And instead, what Nerevi is relying on is that shape being able to take a little bit of bending to work primarily in compression, but to understand that it's also uh, going to, in some ways, be a simply supported beam. You'll notice that it's thicker in the middle, thinner at the edges, but in addition to the gravity load, it is going to have a, a horizontal thrust that needs to be accommodated. And therefore we get the, the raking buttresses that are designed to basically follow the resultant of those two reactions and to push back to keep the arch from spreading out, but also to, to carry its weight uh, down into these foundations. And you can see, if you look closely, the foundations here are slanted, right? They are designed to literally push down and out uh, against the weight of the earth, against the, the, the soil and rock uh, that, are, that are underneath the building. So when we're looking at short vaults as opposed to long vaults, they are always gonna look like arches in section. We are going to see some way of taking that very significant thrust. And these are going to be bigger structures than we see for long vaults where all we're worried about really is just the, the, the center of the vault or the edge of the vault flattening out. You remember we'd see collar beams or little edge beams that would sort of maintain the, the shape. Here we're talking about like primary loads big thrusts that need to be taken up by buttressing uh, or by tension rods, or, or in the case of Maillard, a tension bridge that goes across the middle of, of the arch. One way to think about this is to think that when we're looking at the section of a short vault, we're looking at the, the primary structural action, right? We're seeing the arch very clearly, and we're seeing also the giant big scale buttressing or, or tension that's keeping the arch together. If we're looking at a long span, we're just looking, uh, when we look at it uh, in, in cross section, we're only looking at the depth, right? The, the, the section modulus that we want for it to take up bending in the linear direction, in the long direction, instead of in the, in the curved direction. So that's a, a brief primer on short vaults. We'll move in the next uh, video to tension structures, we'll look at what happens when we go from concrete, usually to steel or to rope, uh, and architectural applications for some of the cable systems that we started looking at uh, back, in, back in 346.